Go thou and make supplication to thy God. I am not able to go and will offer my prayers at home. When his devotions to his feathered God, Pukalimoko, were concluded, a certain religiously disposed individual who had a bird god suggested to the king that through its influence his sickness might be removed. The name of this god was Pau. Its body was made of a bird, now eaten by the Hawaiians, and called, in their language, Ale. Kamuhameha was willing that a trial should be made, and two houses were constructed to facilitate the experiment. But while dwelling in them, he became so very weak as not to receive food. And after lying there three days, his wives, children, and chiefs perceiving that he was very low, returned him to his own house. In the evening he was carried to the eating house. It was deemed pollution to eat in the same hut a person slept in. The fact that the patient was dying could not modify the rigid etiquette. Where he took a little food in his mouth which he did not swallow, also a cup of water. The chiefs requested him to give them his counsel but he made no reply and was carried back to the dwelling house. But when near midnight, ten o'clock perhaps, he was carried again to the place to eat, but as before he merely tasted of what was presented to him. Then Kai Kawawa addressed him thus, Here we all are, your younger brethren, your son Leholeho, and your foreigner, impart to us your dying charge, that Leholeho and Kahumanu may hear. Then Kamahamaha inquired, What do you say? Kaikawawa repeated, Your counsels for us, he then said. Move on in my good way, and he could proceed no further. The foreigner, Mr. Young, embraced and kissed him. Upali also embraced him, whispering something in his ear after which he was taken back to the house. About twelve he was carried once more to the house for eating, into which his, his head entered while his body was in the dwelling house immediately adjoining. It should be remarked that this frequent carrying of a sick chief from one house to another resulted from the taboo system then in force. There were at that time six houses, huts, connected with an establishment. One was for worship, one for the man to eat in, an eating house for the women, a house to sleep in, a house in which to manufacture kappa, native cloth, and one where at certain intervals the women might dwell in seclusion. The sick king was once more taken to his house when he expired. This was at 10 o'clock, a circumstance from which Leliohuku derived his name. As he breathed his last, Kalamuku came to the eating house to order those in it to go out. There were two aged persons thus directed to depart. One went, the other remained on account of love to the king, but whom he had formerly been, by whom he had been had formerly been kindly sustained. The children also were sent away. Then Kalamuku came to the house, and the chiefs had a consultation. One of them spoke thus, This is my thought, we will eat him raw. This sounds suspicious in view of the fact that all Sandwich Island historians, white and black, protest that cannibalism never existed in the islands. However, since they only propose to eat him raw, we won't count that. But it would certainly have been cannibalism if they had cooked him. M.T. Kahumana, one of the dead king's widows, replied, Perhaps his body is not at our disposal. There is more, that is more properly with his successor. Our part in him, his breath, is departed. His remains will be disposed of by the hold of home. After this conversation, the body was taken into the consecrated house for the performance 
of the proper rites by the priest and the new king. The name of this ceremony is Yuko, and when the sacred hog was baked, the priest offered it to the dead body, and it became a god, the king at the same time repeating the customary prayers. Then the priest, addressing himself to the king and chief, said, I will now make known to you the rules to be observed, respecting persons to be sacrificed on the burial of this body. If you obtain one man before the corpse is removed, one will be sufficient, but after it leaves this house, four will be required. If delayed until we carry the corpse to the grave, there must be ten, but after it is deposited in the grave, there must be fifteen. Tomorrow morning there will be a taboo, and if the sacrifice be delayed until that time, forty men must die. Then the high priest, Hiahawa, inquired of the chiefs, Where shall be the residence of King Leholeho? They replied, Where indeed you of all men ought to know. Then the priest observed, There are two suitable places. One is Kau, the other is Kuhala. The chiefs preferred the latter, as it was more thickly inhabited. The priest added, There are proper places for the king's residence, but he must not remain in Kona, for it is polluted. This was agreed to. It was now break of day. As he was being carried to the place of burial, the people perceived that their king was dead, and they wailed. When the corpse was removed from the house to the tomb, a distance of one chain, the procession was met by a certain man who was ardently attached to the deceased. He leaped upon the chiefs who were carrying the king's body. He desired to die with him on account of his love. The chiefs drove him away. He persisted in making numerous attempts which were unavailing. Kalamuku also had it in his heart to die with him, but was prevented by Hukio. The morning following Kamahamaha's death, Liholiho and his train departed for Kuhala, according to the suggestions of the priest, to avoid the defilement occasioned by the dead. At this time, if a chief died, the land was polluted and the heirs sought a residence in another part of the country until the corpse was dissected and the bones tied in a bundle, which being done, the season of defilement terminated. If the deceased were not a chief, the house only was defiled, which became pure again on the burial of the body. Such were the laws on this subject. On the morning on which Leholeho sailed in his canoe for Kohala, the chiefs and people mourned after their manner on occasion of a chief's death, conducting themselves like madmen and like beasts. Their conduct was such as to forbid description. The priests also put into action this sorcery apparatus, that the person who had prayed the king to death might die, for it was not believed that Kamahamaha's departure was the effect either of sickness or old age. When the sorcerers set up by their fireplaces sticks with a strip of kappa flying at the top, the chief, Kiyomoku, Kahumana's brother, came in a state of intoxication and broke the flagstaff of the sorcerers, from which it was inferred that Kahumana and her friends had been instrumental in the king's death. On this account, they were subjected to abuse. You have the contrast now, and a strange one it is. The great queen, Kahumana, who was subjected to abuse during the frightful orgies that followed the king's death in accordance with ancient custom, afterward became a devout Christian and a steadfast and powerful friend of the missionaries. Dogs were and still are reared and fattened for food by the natives, hence the reference to their value in one of the above paragraphs. Forty years ago, it was the custom of the islands 
to suspend all law for a certain number of days after the death of a royal personage. And then a Saturnalia ensued, which one may picture to himself after a fashion, but not in the full horror of the reality. The people shaved their heads, knocked out a tooth or two, plucked out an eye, sometimes cut, bruised, mutilated, or burned their flesh, got drunk, burned each other's huts, maimed or murdered one another according to the caprice of the moment, and both sexes gave themselves up to brutal and unbridled licentiousness. And after it all came a torpor from which the nation slowly emerged, bewildered and dazed, as if from a hideous half-remembered nightmare. They were not the salt of the earth, those gentle children of the sun. The natives still keep up an old custom of theirs, which cannot be comforting to an invalid. When they think a sick friend is going to die, a couple of dozen neighbors surround his hut and keep up a deafening wailing night and day till he either dies or gets well. No doubt this arrangement has helped many a subject to a shroud before his appointed time. They surround a hut and wail in the same heartbroken way when its occupant returns from a journey. This is their dismal idea of a welcome. A very little of it would go a great way with most of us. Chapter 69 Once more upon the waters, a noisy passenger, several silent ones, a moonlight scene, fruits and plantations. Bound for Hawaii, 150 miles distant, to visit the great volcano and behold the other notable things which distinguish that island above the remainder of the group, we sailed from Honolulu on a certain Saturday afternoon in the good schooner Boomerang. The Boomerang was about as long as two streetcars and about as wide as one. She was so small though she were, was larger than the majority of the inter-island coasters, that when I stood on her deck I felt but little smaller than the Colossus of Rhodes must have felt when he had a man of war under him. I could reach the water when she lay over under a strong breeze, when the captain and my comrade, a Mr. Billings, myself and four other persons were all assembled on the little after portion of the deck which is sacred to the cabin passengers. It was full. There was not room for any more quality folks. Another section of the deck, twice as large as ours, was full of natives of both sexes, with their customary dogs, mats, blankets, pipes, calabashes of poi, fleas, and other luxuries and baggage of minor importance. 